Hello, I'm Tim Holy, and today I'm going to be speaking about package latency and what developers can do to reduce it. This is really focused uh, and oriented towards uh, people who create packages for use by the Julia community. Uh, if you don't know what package latency is, I'll, I'll define it uh, shortly, but it, it's an area where I've been putting in a lot of work over the last several years. A lot of the tools that I've created have been oriented at developers, um, and now a lot of the sort of new efforts that um, we've been making over the last year or so are really at, at trying to extend the benefits of, of, of reduced latency to the users of the packages as well. Um, and I'll be introducing some techniques that you can use in your own packages to reduce that latency for your users. So one of the things that I really most love about uh, Julia is that it lets you begin from a very simple place and explore your ideas. And then it offers a really almost continuous uh, pipeline from testing out your ideas for the first time to ending up with a really uh, you know, high polished, uh, widely used package that uh, attracts many uh, contributors from all over. And you, know, you don't tend to get to a point where you have to rewrite a big chunk of it in C and you don't get to a point where you'd like to use two dependencies but they somehow conflict with one another and you just can't get the two of them working together and you have to rewrite a lot of the functionality yourself and so this sort of continuous path of development from simple to to sophisticated is is really a wonderful feature of Julia that doesn't mean of course that it doesn't take a lot of work to get through there it just means that you don't have uh, uh, annoying uh, uh, blocks that seem like they shouldn't be there. And the process of going from your very first uh, ideas about something to a polished package, um, I've at least noticed that it tends to fall in, into a, a sequence of steps, which you sometimes alternate with one another. But you know, early on, probably a lot of the main focus is on adding new features. Your first implementation might be incredibly simple. You might want to add tests to ensure the correctness. And then, of course, when you're writing tests, you often are exercising the, 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 uh, the API of your package, the, the organization of your package. And between that and using it, you may discover that there are some ways in which you haven't really maybe your first choice of design wasn't the best one. And you want to make a little bit of restructuring to improve the, the way that the code gets organized. At a certain point, if you start thinking about maybe attracting some users, you might start thinking about adding some documentation, since that has a really beneficial effect for, for all new users. Um, you may get to a point that despite uh, Julia's remarkable uh, performance advantages, there are times where you wish you had more, right? And so uh, you may then enter a phase of development where you're analyzing the performance of your package and looking for opportunities to, to speed it up uh, still further. And then the topic that I want to address today is, uh, is, is right along in that sort of whole sequence, and that is maybe steps that you could take to reduce the latency uh, of your package. So what is latency? Latency is that sort of annoying delay between when you first uh, you know, start your session and real work starts getting done, basically. And this is always due to compilation. Uh, Julia aggressively compiles your code. This is sometimes known of as time to first plot, although that's just essentially an expression. And it affects any type of code, not just plotting code. And it's that delay, which is somewhat characteristic of, of Julia packages, is I think widely viewed as one of the one of the few negatives of the programming language. Um, and you know, there have been some really good strides made to reduce the impact of that latency for developers and at the level of the language itself for reducing it for users. Things have, I think, gotten quite a lot better recently. But I think now we're also in an era where it, 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 where it will become more profitable for the developers of packages to also take a look at this topic themselves. And I've highlighted two of these steps in color. And the reason for that is that they actually share um, quite a lot in common now. Um, so, uh, and I'll describe what these commonalities are. But basically, they come down to having a fairly standard pipeline for diagnosing problems and then intervening. And whereas, while I think People have been working on improving the runtime of performance of packages for a long time in the Julia community. The tools for that have been around, they're pretty well established. And the knowledge of how you go about improving runtime performance is pretty widely distributed across the ecosystem. The tools for latency have really only just been dropping into place recently. And there are still even some holes in our coverage there, although, although we're, we're doing, I think, pretty well now. <laughs> 
and moreover, the techniques by which you might go about reducing latency, I think are much less well understood. And that's really the main point of today's talk is, is, to, is to arm you with the tools um, that you might need in order to, to start undertaking that, that last step that I list. And because of the analogy between improving runtime and performance and latency, I want to actually just begin by reminding you of the context of how you go about improving runtime performance. Obviously, you know, the first place that many of us start is to just simply time our code. How long does it take to execute? It's not worth, you know, putting a lot of effort into improving something that isn't, isn't all that performance sensitive, right? And so, but if it takes a long time, you might want to know where you're starting at, sort of as a, as a, as a, as a benchmark for what to beat. And you can do this and you can time either your whole application or specific pieces of it. But at a certain point, if this is the only thing you do, it actually ends up getting to be quite frustrating in terms of knowing where to intervene in order to, to make dramatic improvements to the performance of your package. And so one of the best tools that we've had for this, and we've had it for a long time now, is to profile your code. So, uh, and profiling collects detailed runtime information um, about your code. And then you can look at the output from profile, either at the level of just sort of a text dump, or you can also visualize it graphically. And we've uh, this is showing uh, an example from one such tool. There are many such tools in the ecosystem by this point called Profile View. And Profile View displays the profile data as a so-called flame graph, where the vertical axis is the call depth. So the callers are below and the callees are up towards the top. Each block, roughly speaking, corresponds to a single line of code. Uh, or, or, or really a, a single single execution of uh, of a method, or, or sorry, of of, of, of a statement, um, and the width of each one of these blocks. Um, is proportional to the amount of time that it or its callees took, right? And so ones towards the bottom tend to be wide and fat, but that's because they're calling functions that are doing most of the actual work. And the wider they are up towards the top of this graph, the more time they take. There are a few sort of perform common performance gotchas in Julia code. And so those are marked with special colors. So we t often use red to mark the so-called uh, dreaded type instability, where your code is using runtime dispatch to make a call. And the other, uh, another common uh, source of, of, late, of, of slowing down your performance is allocating memory and then the consequent garbage collection. Um, and so we detect the garbage collection events and mark those in orange, for example. And so these types of visualizations really help uh, developers instantly figure out which part of their code is accounting for maybe that unexpected bottleneck that you didn't even know you had until you took a look at it. So in, in, in trying to improve your package latency, it's very much the same sort of, of approach, right? You might begin by just measuring the amount of time that it takes for work to get started. And so that's a good idea. But when it goes time to intervene, you may, if this is all you do, then you are again forced to thrash around somewhat blindly and, and see, what, see what you can try to get to help. And what the recommended thing, of course, now is to try to collect much more detailed data about where your bottlenecks are coming from. And so there are some new tools available, starting with Julia 1.6, um, which allow you to essentially profile the one step of compilation, the so-called type inference step. This is, is sometimes, but not always, a, a major contributor to, to your latency. And it's the place in Julia's whole compilation pipeline for which we have the best tools currently uh, for analyzing and also interventions um, uh, for improving, improving latency. And and some of the changes that I'm going to recommend today go way beyond just the um, uh, inference component of it, because it, we essentially using inference as a window into the entire compilation pipeline. And so you might make these sort of profiling like measurements, and then very much like, like the runtime performance profiling, you might want to visualize the results. And here too, you can collect a, fl a, f a flame graph. The, the, the depth of the graph is the depth within inference, um, so, so an abstract interpretation of your code, how deeply nested is a particular call, and the horizontal bar is time, not the runtime cost of it, but actually the inference time uh, uh, cost of it. 
Um, and and in, in solving inference uh, or looking, looking at these issues here, it's often actually the bottom parts of the bars, which are the entry points into, into inference that are often of greatest interest rather than the tops of the bars like they are in runtime profiling. Also, just like runtime profiling, we mark certain uh, particularly noteworthy uh, in need of addressing uh, features uh, in distinctive colors. And so the, here shown in red are some of the uh, particular combinations of methods and types which appear naively to be unprecompilable. And I'll explain a little bit later what that means. And I'll also point out that, in fact, fortunately, there's actually a lot you can do to change that circumstance. Um, so, uh, of course, inference time is, is a bad thing from the standpoint of latency, but it's sometimes it's typically a good thing from the standpoint of runtime performance. And you, uh, some of the interventions that I'll make today help both of those, but some of them may be uh, directed at trading off one against the other. And you might like to get a sense for when is that trade off worthwhile. So you may have some code that's very performance sensitive. You want that well optimized and running as quickly as it can. But you may have other things that really don't need much time, uh, don't need much optimization because they run very rarely or they, they really account for a vanishingly small fraction of your performance. And so you might want to want to turn down the aggressiveness of your compilation for such methods. And so in order to allow you to sort of get some insight into this trade-off, some of the re recent tools also allow you to compare the timing of inference with the timing with the runtime performance of each method. So this shows a scatter plot. Each dot here is a single method and it's plotting for each method the total amount of runtime on a particular workload against the amount of inference time that it took to infer it and its colleagues. The color of the dots tells you how many specializations, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. And basically what you, what you can say looking at a plot like this is that some of the dots that are over here on the far right-hand side, they do a lot of computation. You probably want those well up optimized. You wouldn't begrudge inference or other stages of compilation, the time spent to make them very optimal. But dots that are far over here on the left and upper uh, corner are ones where you're spending quite a lot of time infer inferring them and they spend almost no time running them. You might consider doing something about those and reducing the, 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 their contribution to your overall latency. Um, the final thing that the tools can do is sometimes actually hint about how you go about fixing something. And I should say that these hints are of somewhat dubious quality, but they are never less useful. So here's an example uh, shown, uh, produced by this package, Snoop Compile, where here we've inferred this method here. And um, in its analysis, it, you can ask it to suggest um, particular um, uh, uh, inter or, or uh, sort of particular ways to intervene into this code. And they are initially some of these diagnostics are somewhat inscrutable maybe initially, but eventually you get to a point where you can look at something like this and maybe see that maybe you should add some type information here. So if we go back and forth between the two versions of code, you can see that one can make this uh, uh, method a lot happier just by adding a couple of, of specific uh, uh, type information here. So. Um, following these hints can sometimes help you decide what intervention to make, although you often have to do a lot of your own thinking. So that was mostly just an advertisement, so, so called for the tools themselves. You might also, before beginning down this road, want to know what kind of outcome could you expect? How much do you, if you put some effort into it, how much will you get? And unfortunately, that's actually quite hard to predict. I've had a few cases where I've been quite disappointed by how little I could uh, reduce the latency of a, of a particular package. And then I've had other circumstances where I've just been utterly delighted by how much snappier everything feels after I give it the treatment. Um, there are anecdotal cases of, of, of where, where people have even managed to reduce latencies from some, appli some applications that took more than an hour to start doing useful work or around an hour to, to start doing useful work down to just a few seconds, which is obviously a big win uh, in terms of quality of life for, for, uh, for using that code. Um, but, you know, sort of in the typical, my at least typical experience in doing this is, is that I can pretty often expect something in the ballpark of a twofold reduction in latency on the very first time I use a method from a particular package. Of course, that benefit declines as you use additional things that can leverage some of the compilation work that's already been done. But it, overall, for let's say a test suite for an entire package, it's, I'm finding it's pretty common to reduce the overall time required by about 30% or so. And it, to me, at least this, this feels you know, genu genuinely worth it. Um, 
it's also worth pointing out that many of these interventions that I'm going to suggest today, they actually might eventually end up giving you even more benefit with further improvements to Julia. So if Julia get, gets even more sophisticated about how it can save compiled code, then, then the types of intervent, interventions that, I, that I'm going to suggest today may have even more dramatic impact in the future. Okay, so so we um, uh, with Shuhei Katawaki, we gave a three-hour workshop um, already on the use of the tools, and so um, and that that workshop was really focused, I think, on on some of the background about the compile pipeline and on the actual use of the tools for diagnostic purposes for how you figure out what is going wrong. And so if you want to see how you use the tools, I recommend that you look at that workshop. What I'm going to be really focusing on today is a little bit on the concepts, but mostly focusing on actually what do the interventions that you might make look like. And I think some of them may may surprise you a little bit um, uh, in terms of what of, of, of what they look like, but, but they end up having actually a very dramatic impact um, on, on your latency. And so I'll, I'll very briefly describe where latency comes from. I'll try to distinguish what I uh, think of as productive, meaning well worth it forms of latency versus unproductive forms of latency. And then mostly I'll focus on some strategies to reduce it basically. So latency comes from compilation and compilation involves one method calling uh, uh, other methods, for example, right? And one of the most important things to make sure that everybody understands um, uh, for the benefit of the rest of the talk is, is this uh, concept called specialization. So you can, as a coder, you can write different methods for the same function. That's one form of specialization, but mostly the kind of specialization that I'm gonna be talking about right now are additional specializations performed by Julia's compiler. So specifically, um, you might write, um, write a particular method of the this function f, and you might allow it to take any input type of real number, it might call both g and h. And you're not really though, there are many different types of real numbers, and so you're not specifying it too tightly what types of inputs this thing might expect. When you actually go to use this function, let's say you pass in an int um, for x, then if you, if when you call f on that, what will happen is if it hasn't already done so, the compiler will create specialized versions of f just for int and all of its callees as well, just for int. If you then later pass in a float 64, the compiler will specialize this very same method and create what's called a second method instance um, for, for this method that is specialized specifically on float 64, okay? And so in general, every time you supply a new combination of argument types to a, to a method, it triggers compilation of new method instances. And it's really a lot of latency tends to come from the diversity of types that you call uh, methods with and, 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 the, and, the, and the sheer number of method instances that might need to be created. So just to sort of give you a sense of, of what scale numbers we're talking about here, if you start a fresh session in Julia, it starts with a, a little over 50,000 method instances at, at the time that I prepared this presentation. Um, if you... Um, uh, if you then load a package, uh, and I'm picking the justifiably popular static arrays here, and you perform a couple of operations um, uh, using it, it, it's not, you know, it and many other packages like it, it's not surprising that you create thousands of new method instances, sometimes many for the same overall method, but just with different, different type arguments being supplied to it. Um, and so it's this compilation of all of this very large number of methods. And that's a lot of what allows Julia to, to uh, you know, be both high performance and very flexible um, in allowing you to combine new types in, in, in new ways um, that accounts for the sheer number of method instances that have to get compiled for these, you know, what might look like relatively innocuous lines of code. And so given the sheer numbers of method instances that often have to be created, your first strategy in, in reducing latency it should generally be to ask yourself, could I get by with fewer method instances? And by that, I don't mean pile all your code into giant methods. That would actually be a really bad idea in general. Um, but what I mean basically is, can you reduce the type diversity by which you need to call your methods? And sometimes you can't, and that's as long as you 
uh, understand why you're doing it, that's perfectly fine. But there are many cases where I think the type diversity that gets used is larger than it might have to be. And it may be larger than it, it really uh, it benefits the users of the package. Let me give you a, a simple example of this. Let's imagine that you're writing a package to either parse text or, or, or output text or something like that. And you might imagine you need to have a certain amount of structure to your sort of document descriptions. And so you create an aligned text uh, kind of object to indicate that a given blob of text should either be, say, left justified or center justified or right justified. And frequently, when people are first introduced to Julia, they tend to fall in love with multiple dispatch and sometimes try to use the type system to essentially solve what might actually just simply be viewed as programming logic problems. And that's fine. And in some circumstances, it's actually a really beautiful extensive uh, gives you a beautiful extensibility. And if you need that extensibility, it's still a great idea. But if you don't really need that extensibility, this hurts because the issue is that for every different option for how your text is justified, Julie is going to have to compile a whole bunch of additional supporting method instances, basically, right? Whereas if instead you simply encoded the justification of, of, of that text, of that string as a, as a field in the type, now you're actually getting by with a single type. There's only one aligned text type instead of at least three different aligned text types for left, center, and, and right justified. And then, of course, you, you do have to make runtime dis uh, decisions about how to justify it. Um, uh, you, instead of using multiple dispatch to make those decisions, but when the amount of computation that arises as a consequence of your choice of, uh, choice of justification is small, this typically has no significant hit. In fact, it can often improve the runtime performance of your code because Oftentimes, if you had, for instance, a document, you might end up having a list of these structured elements. And unless they're all of the same type, then Julia is going to have to use runtime dispatch to call the right methods on these objects if there's many of them. And that um, can really slow your program far more down than, than doing a tiny bit of computation at runtime. So this can be a good idea. Now, again, there are circumstances where that's not a good idea. And that, I'm going to give you another example. It's, a, it's literally of exactly the same thing, even if it lo might look quite different. Let's imagine that you're writing a bunch of code and you end up using an awful lot of, of matrix vector multiplication for two by two matrices, right? If your code does this all the time and you're calling all of these methods that do this in a manner that's friendly to Julia's type inference in a type stable manner, then this is a, can be a huge performance win for you to allow the compiler to specialize your code for particular sizes of matrices. Um, however, if you instead have matrices of many different sizes and things are uh, not called in an inferable fashion, this can be a disaster. This can greatly increase the amount of method specialization required, and it can slow down your runtime because all of your calls have to be made by runtime dispatch. And in such circumstances, you'd be far better off by using types that don't put so much into the type system. The, Julia also provides a few tools for advanced control of specialization. So you can annotate specific arguments as ones that should not be specialized. This is a hint to the compiler not to optimize on, on X, for example. If F is being called inferably with an inferable type of X, Julia will actually still run type inference, even though it won't do any later stages of optimization. But you can block type inference too, just by doing anything that essentially breaks type inference. And, and so if, if, if it can't figure out what X's type is, then it will not even run, run specialization of type inference on F. You can even control the level of optimization used for an entire module's worth of code with, with certain, certain settings that, that apply module-wise. And so all of these are different types of things that you can do to intervene in the specialization of your code. I want to turn to an, the second strategy that you can use to uh, reduce latency, and that is by pre-compilation. So pre-compilation generally refers to executing portion of your pipeline and saving the actual code that gets generated. The most famous example of this is pre-compile, which allows Julia to generate typed code, or which forces it to. And the question is, when does this help reduce latency? 
Um, and so it, it helps when that code ends up getting saved to disk um, uh, for one thing, um, but it, uh, it also, of course, only helps if type inference is a substantial portion of your latency. So if you've measured this and you've convinced yourself that it is, then this might be worth exploring. But it doesn't always work. And I want to give you a simple explanation of why it doesn't always work. And, and I think until recently, it's been a frustrating experience. But now we have these sort of red colored bars. You may remember the flame graphs, and those indicate cases where it isn't going to work unless you do something special. And that what arises is a situation in which you have, let's say, your package, which is combining two separate packages, A and B, and you might be calling a method from A on types returned by B. You can't cache the compiled methods in A because A doesn't know about B, and likewise, you can't cache them in B because B doesn't know about A. The only place to put them is here. But that, uh, and that would work, except for one thing. If the call that's made is not inferable, then those methods will never be cached because they're essentially disconnected from all of the code that's actually living in my package. But if you go ahead and fix your inference problems and you make this call one that the type system uh, can, can, can essentially cache the lookup ahead of time, then all of this code can end up being pre-compiled in here. And so paying attention to your inferability of your package then is the often the key step that makes pre-compile work much more like you might have been hoping it would. And essentially almost lim eliminating all of the type inference from your package. And so you can cache many more of your dependencies. Of course, this is an intervention that typically improves runtime as well as your latency. Um, and there are a number of tools that you can use for figuring out how to go about improving inferability. The last topic I want to hit is um, what I'm going to call argument type standardization. And that is, is that many of us write functions to take, say, generic input types. And that's a good thing. It gives your users flexibility about what they call them with. But in cases where there's nothing really special you're doing with the different representations of integer, if this is some huge thing that takes forever to compile, this is very costly. And so you might consider standardizing the arguments, ensuring that the slow one only ever gets compiled for one type, let's say. And then you have these little stuff functions that standardize the argument type when passed in any other one. This is tiny and therefore fast to compile. This is big and slow, but you only compile it once and therefore you're done. Again, this isn't always a good idea. If you need to do something like automatic differentiation on this code, this might be a disaster if you did this. But there's a lot of code that doesn't require that kind of type flexibility. And so turning it off by a very simple intervention like this can end up having big impacts. And even very simple cases um, uh, can, can, can help a little bit here. I mean, here's an example of just creating an, uh, an array essentially by concatenation. And if these are diverse types, you actually end up losing pre-compilability. If you just simply pay attention to the specific type and make sure it's homogeneous, then, then pre-compilation works. So some fairly simple interventions. You can also just simply declare uh, uh, what type it should have, and then you don't have to use inference to make that decision. So, so a lot of these interventions are, are actually fairly straightforward, but the key is to measure and to figure out where your interventions are needed. And then you know, using some of these tools in your own experience, you can uh, drive the improvements. I'd like to thank in particular, Nathan Daly, who contributed to Julia some of the original sort of uh, inference profiling uh, code and many other contributors who, who have uh, helped bring this um, uh, to fruition. With that, I will quit.